Well, good evening, everyone. Have we, we've got Rory here with us now. Um, I see that Rory's online and can I welcome you? I'm Paul Lucas, I'm president of the Queensland branch of the AIIA. Uh, we're very excited about it. There he Thanks, is. Paul. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, we're very excited about uh, Professor Rory Redcalf uh, to, to speaking to us tonight and um, to do a, a bit of a launch and talk about his uh, very, very good book, The Contest for the Indo-Pacific, which now in this COVID environment seems um, even more topical that, uh, than it ever was. Uh, can I tell you a little bit about um, Rory, a, a very distinguished Australian. Uh, he is head of the National Security College at ANU. He has three decades of experience across diplomacy, intelligence analysis, think tanks, academia and journalism, including as founding director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute um, in government. Uh, he worked as a strategic, senior strategic analysis analyst uh, with the then Office of National Assessments in a, a Canberra's peak intelligence agency. Uh, he was also an Australian diplomat with experience in India, Japan and Papua New Guinea and uh, continues to lead informal strategic dialogues with India and several other Indo-Pacific powers. He has contributed to three landmark reports on nuclear arms control and was on the expert panel for the Australian government's 2016 Defence White Paper. He has been recognised as a thought leader internationally for his work on the Indo-Pacific strategic concept as articulated in his acclaimed 2020 book, Contest for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, he is a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum Register of Experts and Eminent Persons and the Board of the National Foundation for Australia-Chinese Relations. So uh, we'll uh, give you a link and you have a link uh, about the book. But, uh, after you hear Rory and, uh, and ask some questions, I think you, like me, will be very keen to uh, learn even more. So over to you, Rory, and, uh, and uh, welcome and uh, great to hear from you. Paul, well, thank you. And I want to um, thank uh, not only you, but all uh, colleagues at the uh, Australian Institute of International Affairs in, uh, in Queensland. Um, I've got a particular soft spot for AIIA in Brisbane because, of course, um, I, I studied at the University of Queensland and worked uh, in Queensland as a journalist for some time. So I have a, a, a semi-Queensland connection and it's always good to reconnect uh, with the uh, international affairs scene in Brisbane, which I know is, um, is flourishing. Um, I'm going to offer a few opening remarks about the book, if I may, just setting the scene. And um, I'll speak for about 20 minutes or so, really explaining why I wrote this book, what its key argument is, and why I guess it's um, unfortunately very relevant to what's happening in the world today. But I'm especially interested in time for discussion and um, answering questions, and I'll stay as long as I can. I'm also going to, uh, if you don't mind, inflict on all of the participants uh, some, some maps because the book is partly about maps and about how mental maps really help uh, decision makers to frame the world. So what I'm going to do just for a moment now is, um, well, no, the host has disabled attendee screen sharing. I will ask uh, in a moment if um, the host can enable me to share my screen because once I've done that, I can pull up some slides that I want to, um, to talk through. But while we're, um, while we're waiting, hopefully for that, that technical um, miracle to occur, uh, that's fine uh, because I'll, I'll start explaining the book without the, um, without the visuals. So there are actually two editions of the book uh, and the edition we're speaking about tonight, Contest for the Indo-Pacific is the Australian edition. Uh, the international edition has a different title for reasons I can go into later, but uh, it is the same book, so please only buy one edition if you're interested in, in, in reading it. But this book, Contest for the Indo-Pacific, Why China Won't Map the Future, is um, it's a bit provocatively titled at one level. It's, it's not an anti-China book. There's the screen sharing, so I'll pull up the maps as I talk. It's, um, it's not an anti-China book, but what it is, is a book about the, the wider region. It's a book about the, the Indo-Pacific, uh, the fact that China is only part of a much larger region, and we often 
forget about that in a lot of our commentary on, um, on international affairs. If you follow the headlines on any given day, um, you know, there are problems in the Australia-China relationship and the argument is, is made that Australia needs to, to fix this. Well, I think this tends to overlook the fact that China is rising in a very large and complex region. And part of the thesis of the book is to position China in perspective in this much larger region, which is not only the Asia Pacific, as many of us uh, were familiar with the term in the late 20th century, but something larger called the Indo-Pacific. And so this first slide that I'm sharing with you just gives you uh, a sense of scale, a sense of the region that we're talking about here, the region that in fact is Australia's natural home. Um, now for much of uh, the late 20th century, it was very popular to think about Australia's region, that is the region that we needed to engage with economically, diplomatically, strategically, as being the Asia Pacific, essentially East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, and of course the Pacific all the way over to North America. But the argument in my book is that that was actually a very artificial way of understanding the world and understanding the region. And that we were in fact returning to a much more, I guess, traditional place in the world. And that is where we started uh, as a nation. That is Australia as a continent with three oceans around it. Uh, but of course, uh, two very, um, prominent oceans in world affairs, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. We have a West Coast, uh, and interestingly, this was rediscovered over the past 20 years, not because um, India rose to prominence, and part of my story is to say that India is important, that India and other powers in the region matter, as well as China, but also because the rise of China inevitably brought Chinese interests and influence and indeed everything all the way down to military presence into the Indian Ocean. Um, and as you can see in this first map in the presentation, uh, which in fact I've um, shamelessly uh, copied from a, a, an Australian Defence Department map of about seven years ago, when Australia became the first country in the world to formally recognise its region as being the Indo-Pacific, it's the connections, it's the connectivity between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans through the energy, the trade, all of those sinews of, of commerce uh, and, and prosperity and, and, and human well-being that binds our region into one whole, into the Indo-Pacific. And so the very fact that China, Japan, South Korea, so many of the East Asian uh, and Southeast Asian countries were turning their attention uh, southward and westwards towards the Indian Ocean. And India, as it re-emerged from its own relatively closed economic status of the, um, the mid to late 20th century, began to look east. The scene was set for this Indo-Pacific strategic environment. Now that may seem all well and good and a little bit of a um, geopolitics 101 lecture. The important thing is what does it mean? And so the book really has two arguments. The first argument is to say that those of us who were still imagining the region as the Asia Pacific and were forgetting about the Indian Ocean, forgetting about those sea lanes going all the way to the Middle East and Africa, forgetting about the, the rise of India, uh, and who were just fixated on, on China and the Asia Pacific, we really had the story wrong and we needed to correct the perspective. So part of the book is literally to, if you like, act as a kind of corrective to some of the misperceptions and misinformation uh, about Australia's strategic environment and our place in the world. And so that's, I guess, a descriptive uh, argument of the book. The other part of the book, though, is very much about the so what. What does this mean for policy, for the big decisions that countries have to make to secure their future, particularly in this era now, as we're seeing with the coronavirus, where, where contagion uh, in every sense is the order of the day, where the connectivity that nations have built up over the past 30 or 40 years is now suddenly showing its downside, is showing the rapid vectors for not only disease, but also political instability, crisis, uh, economic coercion, and so forth. The book argues then that now that we're in this larger strategic system, a country like Australia can turn the scale of the Indo-Pacific to our advantage because it gives us 
a much larger group of nations with which to partner uh, against the destabilizing elements in the international system, such as in particular, uh, the coercive use of Chinese power. It's also a region that's too large to dominate. And we'll come to that in a moment because there is in my argument, uh, a kind of a, an echo of the history of the Indo-Pacific, which is a history of empires. And it's a history of empires that have generally in the end failed. Um, as pretty much all empires do eventually. So uh, I guess this began in my own mind as a book uh, that was intended to really set the scene for Australia's foreign policy choices in the 21st century in this Indo-Pacific framework. But once I really got into the research, I mean the historical research, what I found really quite astonishing is how consistent an Indo-Pacific framework has been with the way the region has behaved and been viewed throughout history. So we often imagine uh, that there are these very specific um, blocks of the world. There's Asia, there's Europe, there's Africa, you know, mental maps, if you like. And part of the argument of my book is to say that actually mental maps, um, well, they certainly hold power because uh, maps influence the decisions of leaders. They influence the, um, the choices of policy makers, they influence decisions about who is in and who is out of the diplomatic conversations that matter, or what are the kinds of military capabilities we want to develop and what range will they have, or who will we trade with, where should we set up diplomatic missions and so forth. So mental maps have always mattered, but these mental maps are, are really about what's politically useful. There's nothing completely natural about them. And so, for example, when we hear the term Asia, we're actually hearing a term that was first developed uh, by uh, ancient Greeks to describe the entire world that lay to their east. Uh, and it's a definition that then shifted back and forth throughout history and has been used and misused uh, by governments uh, since ever since. I mean, for example, China today uh, promotes uh, a particular coordination mechanism, the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures, very boring name, but it's essentially an Asian for the Asians forum. Only the Asians from China's perspective in that forum are the Asian countries that China perceives as reasonably friendly or easily dominated. Um, and so, for example, Japan and Indonesia uh, have not been included in that formulation of Asia, but Russia has. So mental maps uh, are something that governments can play with. Having said that, uh, as I said, there's been this striking consistency throughout most of recorded history where the region we imagine as Asia, and particularly the maritime region of uh, maritime Asia, was one system. Uh, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Oceans, the sea lanes of Southeast Asia connecting them were viewed as a continuum. And so, for example, this map from the 1400s, a Korean map, and you can tell it's Korean because it's got a very large Korea and a very small Japan. Um, this map imagined South Asia, East Asia, China, India, Southeast Asia, all as really one block. Um, and uh, the settlements along the coast were particularly important because of maritime trade. The, um, the archipelago of Southeast Asia was important as well. This really, if you like, reminded us that right through recorded history, going back to the ancient uh, Indian civilizations that um, had influenced Southeast Asia. Remember, of course, the export of Buddhism and Hinduism uh, as India's major soft power export, the journey of Islam uh, into East Asia and Southeast Asia as well, as a South Asia and Southeast Asia as well. These were essentially Indo-Pacific journeys. The region wasn't broken up into sub-regions. And this was important because the book is partly an effort to, if you like, uh, turn the table on the, particularly the, the, the Chinese government propagandist narrative that somehow uh, China's rightful place is not only at the centre of the world, but at the centre of the Asian system, and that it has always been thus, that China has always by right dominated Asia. In fact, uh, China was prominent, but not dominant in the, uh, the old Indo-Pacific of the, um, the old Indian civilizations or, or Islam, or indeed, uh, as came later, European colonialism. In fact, there was only one really substantial foray 
by China into the Indian Ocean, and uh, before the 21st century, that is, and that, of course, uh, ended in retreat, the, um, the journey of the, the treasure ships of Zheng He in the early 1400s, uh, and extraordinarily, their return back to China uh, after a number of voyages, and the destruction of the fleet, and a decision by the empire not to go there again. And of course, uh, European adventurers seized that opportunity, European colonialism seized that moment, uh, and the colonial era began. Now, the book recounts a little of the history, or retells a little of the history of, of Asia through this two ocean lens, including the history of European colonialism, with all of its downsides, with the brutality, the cultural chauvinism, and so forth, that actually broke a lot of the connections of the old Indo-Pacific, a lot of the connections between Asian societies and re-established new connections between those Asian societies and the European colonial centres. In other words, uh, colonialism also reinforced the connection of maritime Asia to the global system, reinforced those trading connections, the importance of the sea lanes, and so in its own way uh, influenced the, the modern Indo-Pacific. Uh, and of course, in their pushback against European colonialism, Asian societies and Asian powers likewise took a unified pan-Asian view, almost a kind of Indo-Pacific view. And so if you look at the mental maps of Asia throughout history, whether it's going back to the Korean map of the 1400s, or this really extraordinary Dutch map from 1570 by Ortelius of Antwerp, this was from the first semi-accurate atlas, if you like, of, uh, of the world, of the known world, uh, you see that striking resemblance to the very same region that we imagine today as the Indo-Pacific, an emphasis on the connection between the sub-regions, uh, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, Southeast Asia, all in a single frame, uh, coastlines accentuated, seaports accentuated. You even see in this map uh, North America, the, the trade connections that were already occurring into Asia, and even a hint of Australia. It's interesting that that little, that little um, patch of land in the middle of the uh, bottom of this frame is labelled beach. So perhaps those, um, those Dutch map makers knew something about Australia even in the 16th century. Um, now, of course, there are a few somewhat uh, creative flourishes to this map, the, the mermaids and the, uh, and the sea monsters and, and, and such like, but I would argue that they're no more mythical than some of the creative flourishes we see on maps today, such as uh, China's Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea. What's more important is that uh, in the 1500s, there was already this concept of the Indo-Pacific as a single system, as a strategic system, as an economic system, where the behaviour and interests of one power influence the behaviour and interests of others. And so in a sense, as we move through history, the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, uh, we saw this become the norm. Ideas of Asia were of one unified region where, where India and China, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Oceans were considered part of a very clearly integrated whole. And that's really in stark contrast to the way that the region was then imagined uh, in the late 20th century uh, when my own generation of policymakers and diplomats and academics grew up with this, this idea that somehow the Indian Ocean and India were not our business uh, and that we just needed to focus on a very China-centric version of Asia. But as you see, uh, even in these maps and this uh, diagonally um, pivoted map here uh, is one of my favourites from the Australian explorer or Scottish Australian explorer Thomas Mitchell in 1848. The idea of Australia connecting with all of Asia, including the Indian Ocean, for our trade, for our defence, for our security, for all forms of diplomatic engagement. It's not a new idea. The Indo-Pacific was there all along. And what's also, uh, I think, striking, uh, as I began researching these maps, was to discover that some of this way of seeing the world uh, that was actually commonplace in 19th century Australia, but then we sort of forgot about after the Second World War when we began focusing so heavily on East Asia uh, and ignoring the Indian Ocean and India. This um, Indo-Pacific idea of our region and this idea of, um, as we did in Australia, pivoting the map to capture, uh, I guess, Asia in a single portrait-shaped frame has a 
funny resemblance to the way that the Chinese government now imagines the world. Uh, map making, mental maps are partly about policy and the, I guess, frameworks for leaders to make decisions by, uh, and partly, I guess, about strategic wish making. And so the book really draws parallels between a lot of the imperial map making of the European empires and the way in which China is beginning to see the region and the world. And we'll come back to this, um, this interesting Chinese world map in a moment because uh, you might notice among other things that as well as the Indian Ocean being the center of the world uh, with all of its connectivity resources and, and, and so forth, the American continent has been split in two and cast to the outer edges of the universe. So there's something of Chinese strategic wish making in this map, which is, I'm told, very popular with the, um, the PLA Navy. Anyway, um, I'm getting a little bit bogged down in the maps, uh, I warned you, but um, the, I, I guess the key message here is that while we're hearing at the moment in a lot of Chinese policy, the statements by the Chinese government that the idea of the Indo-Pacific is, um, is a nonsense, it's against China's interests. Uh, in reality, we're seeing China not, not only imagine this integrated two ocean region, but we're seeing Chinese behavior, much more importantly, reaching out across the two oceans. We've all heard of the Belt and Road, uh, and um, our friends in the Victorian government have, um, are hearing about it a lot at the moment, uh, but the Belt and Road, whatever else it means, Chinese uh, aid program or maybe a, a, a play at international infrastructure and connectivity or maybe uh, a, a highway for influence. I mean, take your pick. But whatever the Belt and Road actually is, uh, it certainly embraces this two ocean region of the Indo-Pacific. In fact, the Maritime Silk Road, which is the maritime half of the Belt and Road, is basically the Indo-Pacific with Chinese characteristics. It gives us a mental map of the space across which uh, the People's Republic of China is seeking to exert influence. Now, we can debate what kind of influence that is. Is it the normal influence of a rising great power or is it something approaching uh, neo-colonial or maybe even imperial ambitions? We can have that conversation, but we can certainly see very clearly the, uh, the space, the map over which it is meant to extend. And the book argues that that actually has risks for China. It has benefits, but it has risks as well. Um, you know, we're all aware of the great connectivity of our region, um, but we're also increasingly aware that it brings uh, those risks of rapid cascading shocks, contagion, as I've said. Uh, you, can, you can use terms like black swans or black elephants to describe these unexpected shocks. Uh, but the key point is that whatever uh, disruption occurs to the system cannot be contained to one place anymore. We saw, of course, with coronavirus, what began essentially as a localised epidemic within China, uh, rapidly becoming a regional and indeed a global pandemic. Likewise, the book argues that um, because the Chinese system uh, is so based these days on, I guess, the Communist Party seeking to maintain its legitimacy at home by projecting strength abroad, and much of that projection of strength is across the Indo-Pacific, where Chinese Navy has now returned uh, quite formidably for the first time in 600 years, and this time plans to stay. Uh, it also means then that shocks to the system, whether they're shocks that occur domestically in China or whether they're crises that occur outside of China, are going to reverberate uh, really affecting all countries in the region and affecting China internally as well. And it's going to be very interesting to watch how the current face-off on the India-China border plays out in, in that regard. So look, I'll wrap up on a couple of the um, the so what's, the, the policy conclusions from my book. I mean, as I said at the beginning, this is, uh, although the subtitle of the book, Why China Won't Map the Future, uh, suggests it could be seen as an anti-China book. It's not, I think, in any narrow sense, an anti-China book. It's certainly not against uh, the Chinese nation or people or culture. It is a book, however, that questions very directly the agenda uh, of the Chinese Communist Party and especially the agenda of Xi Jinping as leader under his leadership. 
because what's happened, I think, is that uh, over the past 10 years, uh, he and his leadership group have essentially taken the decision to double down on internal repression, on authoritarianism, on nationalism, and we're, we've all heard about Wolf Warrior. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I recommend that you do, um, because it does provide a fascinating window into the psychology of Chinese nationalism. But also that Xi Jinping has made a massive gamble on the projection of Chinese power and interest abroad, whether it's through economic means or also through security means, military espionage and so forth. And I think, to be fair, that the jury is actually out on whether that gamble is going to pay off. My argument in the book is that it's a very high risk, high stakes game. China spends a lot of money persuading us of three things, that its rise is benign, uh, that uh, its rise is unstoppable, and thirdly, that if you get in the way, you will be hurt. Uh, there's an interesting set of contradictions there. The book poses questions about that and basically says that uh, China is biting off more than it can, it can chew. That, that through the Belt and Road, through a lot of its activities in the region, uh, in a sense, uh, China is overextending. Uh, it has seized a window in time, uh, perhaps noting the leadership, noting that the population is going to age, that there are problems of dissent and environmental degradation and so, so forth domestically, and that perhaps this is the best window, the best moment for China to lock in its power gains in the world. But having said that, there's an impulse towards overextension. And I would argue, as I conclude in the book, that it is actually in the interests of the many other countries in the region, uh, Australia and all the other middle powers, to set limits to Chinese influence, to band together when they can in pushing back, because this is a book about multipolarity, a sea of many flags, which the region has always been. And that by building those new linkages and pushing back, in fact, in time, we may actually be doing China a favour, helping to find a settling point for its ambitions, short of crisis and short of conflict. There's a lot more I can say, but I think I should leave it there at this stage, Paul, and um, let's go to the discussion. Okay, well, look, thanks very much, Rory. That has been a fantastic kickoff. Um, and we've got a number of questions that have come in, and I'll encourage some more as well. But I, I might lead off with, um, uh, with a question to you. Um, uh, your book, uh, you talk about that it's not just a bilateral world. It's not China and the US. It's far yeah. broader than that. You give an example uh, that by 2050, uh, the economies of Indonesia, uh, Japan, and India combined will be very will be much larger in size than either China or the US. And so, it is not a question of this binary choice. Indeed, you speak about multilateralism um, and quads. I see mm -hmm. Peter Bagis doesn't have Indonesia in the quad that he has. He has the US. Uh, I'm more attracted to the Indonesian one. Can you talk about these quads? Can you talk about yeah. what the middle powers, as you describe them? And of course, we're not economically massive like some of those others, but you see us as having a role there. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so first thing to note is that the, um, in some ways, some of the projections in the book have already been uh, affected or overtaken by COVID-19. I mean, this book was... Uh, completed late last year, went to print at the beginning of this year uh, at a time when I, I suspect not even the Chinese leadership knew the full extent of the calamity that was unfolding out of, um, out of Wuhan. But having said that, the, um, the book does make the argument that every time we hear all these optimistic projections that China will have the largest economy in the world by any measure, it already does by one measure, but not by another, and that somehow we just have to get with the program now and sign on to, I guess, a Chinese dominated region. We forget about the, uh, the strength and the agency and the growth of the rest. And the, the same, in fact, often the same forecasters who project the growth in the Chinese economy will also project the growth in the economies of Indonesia, India, Vietnam, a lot of the other countries of Asia. Japan is not growing, but it's so substantial still that even a weaker Japan is going to be a very major balancing force in the years to come. And this is all putting America out of the picture for the moment. 
So indeed, I do make the point, uh, make the point slightly cheekily early in the book to say that uh, by the 2040s uh, or towards 2050, uh, India, Indonesia and Japan combined will have a larger economy than China, uh, a larger population than, than China. Actually, they already have a larger population than China. In fact, India will very soon have a larger population than China, but even a larger defence budget than China. Now, that begs a few questions. One, of course, is how on earth are those countries going to band together to achieve any kind of effective solidarity to balance against China? but also the enormous problems that those countries face. And we're already seeing with India and Indonesia that they're going to be hard hit by COVID-19, and that is going to slow the economic projections uh, that I wrote about in the book. But they are youthful countries. They're young countries, they're resilient countries, they're, they're what I would call anti-fragile countries as well. And so if you're giving me a 20 to 30 year time frame, I still think they're going to be very substantial powers and they're going to have very different interests to the interests of China. The, um, I think the error that China has made and is still making to some degree is that it seems actually quite effective at provoking this balancing behaviour by other countries. It had a chance before around, I'd say, 2010, the uh, first decade of this century, China was working very hard on a charm offensive and also on allowing a reasonable degree of opening up at home. And that was the hopeful window, I think, for China. But what we saw instead is that um, over the last 10 years, China has effectively managed to, one by one, and sometimes simul simultaneously, uh, deepen mistrust with most of its key neighbours. And India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Japan, I would rate very heavily in that list. Um, so what, what's the opportunity now? Again, it's not about forming hard alliances against China. And I think one of the myths about the so-called quadrilateral and for uh, participants, uh, listeners, uh, awareness, most of you will know this, but those uh, who may, may not, the quadrilateral that we hear about a lot, uh, the quadrilateral dialogue or quad, is a grouping of Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. Uh, we're not a formal alliance, but we share a lot of our assessments, we have regular diplomatic meetings, we're beginning to do things like training and coordination and so on together. And it's potentially a very powerful grouping. It's not going to turn into a hard alliance anytime soon, but nor is it going to disappear. It was a group of countries that got together originally to respond to the terrible tsunami in the Indian Ocean back in 2004. So it was a disaster relief mechanism to begin with. It was temporarily um, walked away from by the Rudd government at a time when a lot of countries were getting cold feet about that sort of thing. But it's now back with a vengeance. And interestingly, it's becoming a core group now for coordination on the COVID-19 response and the development of alternative supply chains, particularly for sensitive industries. Uh, so the Quad has a future, but Minilateralism, that interesting term that essentially means small groups of countries self-selecting to cooperate uh, for practical purposes, minilateralism really is the name of the game now in the Indo-Pacific. Um, Australia, India, Japan, to some extent Indonesia, uh, there's even an Australia-India-France dialogue that goes on quietly behind the scenes. So there's, there's all sorts of creative new arrangements that are being produced because uh, we're in a bigger region now with greater connectivity. We know uh, we, we have a wider range of friends to choose from. Most of us, these players in the middle, are nervous very much about Chinese power, but also about American dysfunction. And we're just really testing the boundaries of what we can do uh, with one another. So I see minilateralism as part of this Indo-Pacific wave of the future. And look, I agree, Paul, we should play with creative arrangements. Uh, there's no reason why we can't try to bring Indonesia into one of these uh, in time. Uh, uh, one of our uh, questioners, uh, a former Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum once described the Pacific as the hole in the apex donor. What risk is there that the Pacific, uh, that is the Pacific Island states, could suffer the same fate in an Indo-Pacific construct? Look, it's a great... <laughs> It's a great question, and um, you know I'm very sensitive to the interests of the Pacific Island states that are often very, you know, very unlike the interests of 
the, the larger states in the Indo-Pacific. But I'd turn it around a little bit and I'd actually challenge the idea that the Indo-Pacific neglects the Pacific. Actually, I think it privileges the island states of the South Pacific, or it will over time, provided that countries like Australia uh, can really follow through on a lot of their commitments. What do I mean by that? I mean, at one level, the Indo-Pacific is criticised as being somehow an excuse for big countries to ban, or, or middle-sized countries to band together to balance against China. Um, but I would argue that objectively, the Indo-Pacific came about partly because countries like China were extending their economic and strategic interests much further from home into the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. So in a way, the rest of us are responding to, um, I guess, the, the first moves by China. The Asia-Pacific idea, uh, which again went through a rather sort of tortured beginning in the 1970s and 80s, um, and was about somehow connecting Southeast Asia, East Asia, North America, Australia, and so on. We wanted to keep the Americans engaged in the region. We wanted to make the most of the growth of um, the tiger economies and so on. That regional construct never really had a place for the Pacific Island countries or for the Indian Ocean Island countries for that matter. The difference about the Indo-Pacific is that it is primarily a maritime region, because my book makes arguments that the maritime will prevail over the continental, will prevail over the land in economic relations and in military uh, influence as well. And we can have that conversation if we have time. But the Indo-Pacific does privilege the connectivity through the sea lanes and the, the maritime space. And so, in a way, countries like Australia or our partners, like Japan, for example, are looking now very closely at the, the needs and the dynamics of nations and societies in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And we're also finding interesting parallels uh, because in many ways, their concerns about governance, about uh, population health, about resource security, about protecting their sovereignty, they're quite similar in, in both the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And the Indian Ocean, as the book argues, already provides a kind of a laboratory for what can go wrong. And so if you look at the story of Maldives, of the Chinese influence through Belt and Road uh, debt initiatives in Maldives, if you look at the pushback by a democratically elected government against that in Maldives, it uh, partly because the previous government had been corrupt in its China dealings, um, you actually see almost a template for how things could unfold in the Pacific. And I think it's in our interest now for a country like Australia to, yes, help our Pacific neighbours focus on their needs, uh, their material needs and the uh, development of their societies, but also to be much more mindful about the protection of their sovereignty than some of the unfortunate countries in the Indian Ocean have been. Uh, I've got a number of questions and I'll try and group them together because you're getting great interest, you're stimulating a lot of discussion, and they relate perhaps to the, um, uh, the perception of China at the moment as a result of a number of behaviours. Uh, we've seen uh, the, you know, the potential of the COVID-19 backlash against them, uh, the perception of uh, some of the behaviour of the uh, Chinese government's reaction to criticism overseas, the Hong Kong issues, um, uh, how Australia has handled the Chinese um, issue um, uh, with respect to World Health Organization, but uh, generally, uh, how do you see, uh, it, it seems that it's you know, really quite counterproductive for China at the moment, uh, almost a sort of a, you know, um, uh, a um, ham-fisted way of handling uh, disputes that ne necessarily happen between countries uh, in the world. Um, what are your comments on that? Yeah, look, I'd, I would um, just recap my point that um, I, I, I preface all of this by saying, you know, this is not an anti-China book in a civilizational sense, but it is a book that points out, I think, a lot of the self-harm that the CCP under its current leadership is doing to China's interests. Um, you know, a great counterfactual would be to imagine um, China in the early 1990s and to imagine that we didn't have a China where um, intense nationalist indoctrination uh, had become the order of the day. Because you have to remember that after the Tiananmen massacre in 1989, one of the ways in which 
the Communist Party sought to assert control and reassert control over the population was suddenly to make nationalism really at the centre of, uh, of education. Uh, and in that, that involved in many cases a demonisation or a re-demonisation of the West, of America in particular, of Japan as well. And I guess um, Australia falls somewhere in the category of a, a minor demon in that, in that cosmology. That's a real shame because, um, you know, there, there was and is, I think, a great need, uh, as in any major state among the Chinese people, for, uh, for a country, uh, for a government that, um, that first and foremost puts their, their full comprehensive development, that is, their economic development in a stable and peaceful international environment, really right to the fore. But unfortunately, the needs of economic development in China, uh, which are absolutely desirable and, and right and, and in many ways commendable, have clashed with that intense nationalist impulse that the party has been using to uh, deepen its control. And in the last 10 years, this has only gotten worse, uh, sad to say. So I think in a way, um, there is, you know, there's almost, perhaps there's an accidental imperialism forming. I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm not of the view as some are, and you'll find some in, for example, the Trump administration who'll say that China has essentially a master plan, you know, for domination, um, that everything it does is wrong or a lie or a risk. You know, that's not true. Um, but those voices in the Chinese system that want a more moderate, way of engaging with the world um, are, are at the moment submerged, um, suppressed, repressed, you know, in many cases uh, imprisoned or silenced. And so instead, you've got this, as, as I would argue, self-defeating nationalism, this, um, this kind of sorcerer's apprentice that's been, you know, unleashed. And so in a sense, uh, I fear that the Chinese system almost can't help itself now. Um, and so, for example, if there is a clash with another country over an issue of interests or principle, and I could list 10 countries right now that this has happened to in the past few years, China's always in the right. Uh, the other country's behaviour is always an insult to the feelings of the Chinese people, according to the Communist Party. And the only solution can be, I think, you know, even uh, an even greater uh, toughening of China's line. And I see a contradiction that will play out more and more over time there. And I was absolutely serious about the, the wolf, watching the Wolf Warrior movie, um, because we're now seeing that echoed in Chinese diplomacy. Um, it's not sustainable in my view, certainly not over a, a 10 to 20 year time frame. They might get away with it for a number of years, but over a generational time frame, it's not going to be sustainable, I think, for China to really see every act of resistance uh, to its interests or to the way it sees its interests as being uh, something that cannot be compromised with. And I think you will see, and I think we saw the first hints of this with COVID-19, you will see parts of the Chinese population openly rejecting that kind of thinking. I mean, there will be continued rule through uh, falsehood and fear and also through in many cases, the, the satisfaction of economic need, which is, which is a good thing. But I do think that, uh, that over time, it's going to get harder for the party to convince the Chinese population of all of these issues. And I guess some of the data I draw on for that in my book is simply by aggregating the, uh, the number of people of either Chinese origin or uh, over whom China claims sovereignty who have one way or another already rejected uh, a totalitarian vision of rule by the Chinese Communist Party. You know, if you bring together uh, in a kind of mental arithmetic, uh, the Tibetans, the Uyghurs, the Taiwanese, uh, Hong Kongers, pro-democracy activists, the Falun Gong movement and so on, you've already got a population there that is larger than Russia or Bangladesh of people who are not happy at some point or other with the rule of the CCP. No wonder the party and the leadership show such extreme anxiety. Um, there's a great book that I'd recommend, um, even better than mine, uh, by um, a guy named Carl Minzner, who's uh, an American uh, international lawyer, and another by Dave Shambo, a uh, great China scholar. Uh, their two books, um, End of an Era, and I think um, China's Future, question mark, better than I do, portray the contradictions in this 
um, in, in this system internally and make the view that the only solution for the party over, let's say, the next 10 to 20 years is to start easing, uh, its, easing its controls, to start moderating, and to start moderating uh, its ex external belligerence as well. Uh, we've got so many questions and we've only got 16 minutes left, so I'll, I'll double a... I'll give you a short answer this time, Paul. Ah, I'll double a few up. Um, yeah. Uh, one um, uh, one question, uh, uh, where does Vietnam fit in? Um, you know, you go to Vietnam, yeah. they will tell you that the United States and France were a mere, you know, puff in the wind compared mm. to uh, their uh, their relationship with China and uh, and the occupation for a thousand years and and, and getting rid of them. Uh, the first question is, uh, where do uh, where do they fit in? They're an increasingly substantial country, mm -hmm. but they they share a border with China. So that's the first one. How do you see them, uh, and uh, how do they see themselves? Uh, uh, the second question is that the Asia Pacific has real institutions, APEC, ASEAN, whereas Indo Pacific doesn't really have. It has meetings, as you say, um, quads. It has. Um, uh, not a robust institution with a secretariat. What do you say uh, is needed to give a real cohesive um, uh, organisational structure around that Indo-Pacific construct? Great. Um, so Vietnam, uh, look, I think, and there is a, a few sections in the book on Vietnam. Um, you know, I've got a lot of respect for the way in which Vietnam handles relations with China. I think we could learn a lot from from the Vietnamese on that, um, but you know I think we should make absolutely no mistake that Vietnam is a model of the kind of of other Asian nationalism that China um, underestimates at its peril. You know, and I'd say that uh, Indian and Indonesian and Japanese nationalism and Korean indeed are, are some of the others that, um, that, that that clearly can be a real challenge for, for China. But Vietnam's interesting because as I recount in the book, um, I put a question once to a Vietnamese diplomat, actually it wasn't my question, it was a colleague's question. Uh, the question was put to him, look, if Vietnam gets into trouble with China in the South China Sea, i.e. if the shooting starts, because of course they do have direct territorial disputes, who's going to come to Vietnam's aid? Who really will come to your aid? You know, can you really count on the Americans or whoever else it might be? And this very senior diplomat, Vietnamese diplomat, um, I think looked very, he, he didn't skip a beat. He just looked very coolly back at his interlocutors and just said, the Vietnamese people. And I'm sure he was speaking from experience because in a sense, as you say, if, if, if Vietnam has humbled uh, America, uh, in living memory, and of course, France before that. And um, if much of that was through, uh, really, I think the power of, um, of Vietnamese nationalism and, and, and the solidarity and resilience of its people, then uh, you know, China is going to be actually careful. I think that um, we've got to remember that China has fought Vietnam before in 1979. It was actually a stalemate and a grand folly by the Chinese. Um, the Vietnamese, I think, don't forget this kind of thing. And I think in a sense, they're very pragmatic now in engaging with America, Australia and others, um, but they're looking to their own defences, uh, buying submarines from the Russians and so forth. So I think Vietnam is a partner worth cultivating, although of course, for a country like Australia, we've got to bear in mind that we really um, can't exaggerate the, the congruence of political values with Vietnam, which is also a, a communist one-party state. But but very important. On the other question about, um, about institutions, the Asia Pacific versus the Indo Pacific, you know, at one level, this gets a little bit esoteric because it's all about acronyms and meetings of diplomats and so on, but it obviously uh, has a serious intent because over time, if groups of nations collectively form in their own minds, a sense of region and look at Europe, look at the European Union, for example, it can have very tangible real effects. And if that's not happening in the Indo-Pacific, then is it just really, you know, a, a flight of, um, of my imagination? Well, the reality is a little bit different because in fact, a lot of the so-called Asia-Pacific institutions and APEC is one um, because of course um, it's called Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation and it doesn't include India and it does include China. APEC's actually a very weak institution. 
um, as Gareth Evans used to call it, it was for adjectives in search of a noun. Um, and in fact, APEC has increasingly, I think, been eclipsed by another institution over the last 15 years, which is called the East Asia Summit. But what's fascinating about the East Asia Summit, which is now really the crowning regional institution, and along with the East Asia Summit, there are several others, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus and so forth. It's actually an Indo-Pacific institution already. And so one of, the, um, one of the developments my book recounts is that in the 1990s, as our leaders, our diplomats were trying to build this sense of regional community, uh, we thought we were building it around East Asia and the Asia Pacific, but once we uh, drew up the membership lists, it became the Indo-Pacific. And a key point was in 2005, when Australia, and I remember this as an intelligence analyst following it very closely, when Australia was trying to join this new East Asia summit, and China worked very actively to try to exclude Australia and India and New Zealand from the East Asia summit, our friends in Southeast Asia and Japan worked very hard to get us through the door. And so, the creation of the East Asia Summit in 2005 was actually a turning point towards the Indo-Pacific. It doesn't mean that these institutions are finished um, because there isn't uh, great depth, you know, there aren't formal secretariats or large bodies of treaties or so on underlying them, but it's a beginning. However, I think that the real diplomacy of the Indo-Pacific is going to work simultaneously at three levels. There will be the big bilateral relationships, there will be these multilateral forums like the East Asia Summit, but it's going to be the minilaterals, as I said, the small, capable, self-selecting groups that are going to make uh, all the difference. And I think that's where Australia can play um, an outsized role. Our next two questions. Um, a number of uh, uh, attendees have uh, asked about the uh, Belt and Road in the context of the Victorian government. Um, we've certainly seen the United States make a few comments. We've seen uh, the Australian government potentially uh, being dragged into that, whether that's through ultimately on an individual basis with FIRB or whatever. But certainly, with the, you know, that, that is a, an issue of some controversy at the yeah. moment. So if you could co comment on that. Uh, but uh, the, the other one is that uh, uh, do you consider it likely that we will see a hot conflict take place in the Indo-Pacific in the coming years. And you and I had a bit of a talk about this um, in, this afternoon. In 1965, of course, um, in Indonesia, uh, with the 30 September, uh, uh, the 30 September movement, what started as a reaction to a communist activity ended up being an anti-Chinese pogrom. Mm. Now, the Chinese are now, um, you know, they've come out of the century of humiliation. Uh, is it likely, much like the Americans would do, do you think that perhaps you may see a Chinese intervention if something like that ever happened again in its area of influence to uh, Chinese people? Yeah. Look, um, short answer to the second question is yes, and we'll come back to that. And again, I say, watch Wolf Warrior 2. Um, but on the Belt and Road, look, the um, you know starting point, uh, the region needs investment, and I just want to say the region, I don't just mean Victoria, I mean the Indo-Pacific. Uh, all of these countries need investment, they need infrastructure, and they need it on terms of good governance, environmental sustainability, and so forth. And a lot of the BRI activities that China undertakes don't fit, don't fit those criteria. But we need, we need the, uh, the investment in infra infrastructure. It's going to happen uh, in the region, regardless of whether countries sign essentially blank check agreements with the Chinese government called Belt and Road Memoranda of Understanding. And unfortunately, that seems to be what the Victorian government has done. Um, seven years ago, when Xi Jinping essentially dreamed up the BRI, the Belt and Road, it was called One Belt, One Road back then, because of course, um, like all roads leading to Rome, all roads in the Belt and Road lead back to, um, to China, lead back to Beijing. But when he came up with the Belt and Road Initiative, and once his bureaucrats realised he was serious about it, uh, there began an intense campaign of propaganda, an intense campaign of persuading the region, persuading uh, developing countries in particular, uh, but also developed countries, uh, that what they really needed was not only 
Chinese investment and infrastructure, but Chinese investment and infrastructure essentially on political terms that suited the interests of the Communist Party. In other words, every time a foreign government is given a draft agreement by Chinese diplomats, uh, very much worded in Beijing, uh, worded uh, in language that will essentially praise the um, praise the, the ideology of the Chinese system, because that's basically what these agreements do. Every time those governments then sign those agreements without negotiating them first, and New Zealand did this even before uh, Victoria, and uh, a bunch of countries in Eastern Europe and Africa and elsewhere have, have done, done the same, uh, it actually undermines the position for all of the other countries. It weakens the position for, let's say, the Solomon Islands or Papua New Guinea or Vanuatu, uh, you know, or any country that needs investment and infrastructure, uh, but actually would like it to be delivered in terms that are based on good governments, labor rights, environmental sustainability, you know, so many of the values you would want uh, in, you know, if someone was building a, um, building a, a highway in your neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, the Victorian government let down its regional neighbours by simply signing the document that it was given, um, a document that is entirely uh, uncritical about the kinds of developments that, that might follow. And also problematically, the Victorian government did so, it appears to be against the advice of the Commonwealth government on what is essentially a foreign policy issue, which under the constitution is, um, is the Commonwealth's business. So we've got a problem. I think um, I'd like to see Canberra and Melbourne find ways of, you know, moderating this and winding back. I don't think Pompeo's intervention was helpful. In fact, I think it was really unhelpful because it was ill-informed and he seemed to connect the Victorian Belt and Road MOU with issues about telecommunications and 5G, which are quite separate and where Australia is already extremely robust. Uh, and of course, you then get some whataboutism whenever we people you know, like me criticise Chinese economic coercion, you'll hear criticism of um, America as well. So that was a pity. Uh, the US Embassy has very wisely intervened now to, to backtrack from Pompeo's statement, and that is as it should be. Finally, on your, um, your really, I think, um, provocative question about pot conflicts, I think it is a fair question to ask. And in the final chapter of the book, I look at plausible futures, including the many situations that could lead to a hot conflict in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I do think that the trend lines are bad. Uh, the trend lines are towards the Chinese government, the party raising expectations in the Chinese people that whenever Chinese nationals get in trouble anywhere in the world, no matter why, the People's Liberation Army will be there to help them. Now, of course, um, that is uh, a pretty uh, extreme fantasy in many circumstances, but a little bit like the Rambo movies in America in the 1980s, I do think there's a psychological effect of this kind of culture uh, that raises the expectation that the PLA, because let's face it, China is spending vast amounts of money on the PLA, and this has been widely advertised to the Chinese people, expectations that the PLA can intervene and will intervene. Of course, the reality is that China is actually quite risk averse. I think one of the points I would say in China's favour over the past few decades is that, you know, it makes a lot of noise, but in fact, when it comes to the crunch, it's very risk averse when it comes to conflict. Um, the last time the PLA fired shots in anger was against a bunch of um, hapless Vietnamese Marines stranded on a reef in 1988. And there's footage of that that you can find online if you, if you really want to see something um, very unpleasant. But also against Chinese nationals, uh, students and young people in the, the centre of Beijing. The PLA uh, is powerful, has enormous um, budget growth and so forth, but it is untested in combat. And so uh, the first time, and it will happen, the first time that the Chinese leadership makes a decision to send the PLA to intervene, whether it's for a stabilization mission or an anti-terrorist mission uh, somewhere overseas, uh, the dice will be rolled and a big gamble will have been taken. Uh, and we just don't know which way that will go. It could be very bad for regional order or for the legitimacy of the party. And I would put 
um, the small island states in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, uh, as well as uh, a number of countries in Africa as being the most likely places where eventually this, this could happen. Now, that just about takes us to the end of the evening. Uh, what a great evening, but I'll, I'll just... Not, not a cheery ending for you there, Paul. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I'll shoot you with, 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 with just with one other, shoot one other question to you uh, that perhaps you could give us in two bullet points or very quickly. Uh, what is Australia's gravest misstep regarding the Indo-Pacific region in recent times? And on the other side of the coin, what is its best initiative in terms of the Indo-Pacific region in recent times? Okay, they're big, great questions. And, um, you know, although I'm generally pretty sympathetic to our policy makers, I don't mind mentioning missteps. Well, it depends how far back you want to take uh, recent, recent times. But I would say that, um, look, on the positives first, the, the whole, um, I guess, diplomatic entrepreneurialism that Australia has shown with this idea, the fact that you know, our foreign policy and defence policy white papers have really led the regional diplomatic push towards this Indo-Pacific redefinition. Um, you know, Australia's done a lot of creative work behind the scenes to engage with countries like India, Indonesia, Japan, building a lot of these minilaterals, rebuilding the Quad. Um, you know, Australia has, has been a lot more creative than I think it's given credit for. So I would, I would wrap all of that up, if you like, almost as the, the Indo-Pacific strategy in the making. We, we're not there yet because strategy involves... Uh, you know, ways, ends and means. It involves much greater mobilisation of resources than we've probably achieved yet. But I think Australia is, is on the right path there. Um, what have been the missteps? I think there have been times when um, Australian governments have been very inconsistent and have, I guess, taken positions and then stepped back. I mean, the withdrawal from the Quad in 2007 was an example of that. The, um, the unfortunate way in which the uh, submarine deal with Japan played out uh, several years ago was another, where I think Japan's expectations were raised, uh, but Australia in the end, for I'm sure technical reasons, chose a different submarine design. I think that made things a little bit awkward with a really important relationship. Um, and I think there've been times when Australia has been inconsistent. So. We, we talked a lot about a rules-based order in the region, but then until not so many years ago, we were not exactly um, adhering to a rules-based order in aspects of our relationship with, with East Timor and uh, the, the Timor Gap. So I would say there have been such moments, but I think overwhelmingly Australia is on now, I think, a, a sensible path in its regional diplomacy. I don't envy our policymakers engaging with China. They come in for a lot of criticism uh, from both sides. Uh, but I think the, the way forward is going to be really standing Australia's ground in Australia's interest and, and being patient because, um, you know, again, I have a lot of sympathy for those who, who uh, will have difficulty from the economic leverage that China is bringing to bear against Australia. But if you take a time frame of years rather than uh, a political cycle of, of weeks, months, and so forth, uh, I think that Australia will, will prove to be resilient uh, and will in fact be a more effective partner for China and the region um, afterwards. Thank you for a wonderful presentation tonight. Great questions, uh, uh, really entertaining. Uh, can I again recommend to people that uh, Rory's book is a is a, a very very good read indeed. Uh, I would uh, uh, strongly uh, recommend it. Uh, it's thirty two dollars ninety nine if you want it in the flesh. If you're old fashioned like me, or fifteen dollars if you want it electronically. Uh, but uh, there's the link you can see on the uh, on the screen there, blanky blanky books uh, if you are interested in it. So again, thank you, Rory, for being the guest of the AWIA Queensland branch. Uh, we, you can have a look at our website for our upcoming webinars where, and of course, in this current environment, our, uh, uh, our other branches of uh, the AIA uh, in other states and territories and nationally have got some really interesting stuff on as well, including a really good webinar tomorrow night, if I recall correctly, from the ACT. So thanks again very much, uh, uh, Rory, and uh, thank you everybody for attending.
Thanks, Paul. I hope to see you all, see you all in person again one day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.